Hey everyone, welcome to the fifth episode of the Time for a Hand Up podcast. I am the founder and host, Jeff Moore, and it's my great pleasure to uh, have with me tonight uh, a guest and an old friend, Ian Smith, better known as Smitty, to his friends. I'm going to just share a few, um, a few points about why uh, I've created this podcast and then get into introducing Ian and having a, a good discussion. So um, uh, quite a few years ago, I uh, was uh, an entrepreneur uh, of a venture that uh, was not successful and had quite a few challenges. And at the end of that led to uh, a several week hospitalization. And so uh, I've put together this podcast to help to, uh, to, help to uh, combat uh, mental health stigma and to also remind people that um, uh, both physical and mental health are intrinsic parts of being alive for every human being. So why is it that we often make it more difficult for those who are undergoing challenges at any given time to, to seek help and to reach out to, to, to get help? And so uh, I initially called this the PIN podcast because it is true that no matter how strong uh, uh, somebody is, men and women around the world, anyone can find themselves pinned by a mental health challenge. And so again, I, I am uh, inviting guests with lived experiences who are healthcare providers who are involved in various companies or with, with products and services that, that provide solutions. And uh, so tonight, again, uh, we are Thursday, April 7th, 2022. And uh, I'm very happy to, to introduce Ian Smith. We're gonna have a good chat in the next few minutes. I'll just give a, a quick uh, introduction to Ian. So Ian is uh, 48 years old and has cerebral palsy, a disability that affects his speech and, and fine motor skills. For the past 25 years, Ian has been working in the field of intelligence gathering and analysis for public and private organizations. Since the age of eight, Ian has experienced the highs and lows of being integrated into the mainstream of society as a person with a disability, constantly being faced with several challenges. He has the support from colleagues, friends, and family, which motivates him daily. So Ian, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, again, um, we go back a long time, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll pass it over to you if you just to say a few words at the start, and then we can get into our discussion. Yes, yes, thank you, Jeff, for inviting me on your podcast. It's been a, a, a while since we have been over 30 years, 30 years ago, and it's a good about how time flies and how we, we connected a years ago over. I think it was Facebook, or was it uh, through a mutual friend of ours? Right. Anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's great to be on the podcast. Fantastic. So, Smitty, maybe we can go back for a minute to the great times at Camp Massawippi, where we first met, and so many incredible people, great counselors, lots of fun, and that's a camp run by the, the wonderful people at the Mackay Center, which I now believe is now the MAB Mackay, but I don't know if there's any little story or anecdote that you'd want to share from any of the, the fun times or experiences there. Um, maybe I can think of a few that will get myself in trouble or anybody else in trouble because the, the COVID fun and the, the the fun that everybody gets to see. No, um, Kamazumi, Kamazumi is a kind of a special place in my heart because it, uh, it, it's a sleep, it's more than a sleepaway camp. It's a camp where nobody sees any disability. Well, in our own little ecosystem outside um, Montreal. So you can have several disabilities, oh, sorry, a variety of disabilities under the same roof. 
So it was a it was a quite an experience on the print of the cigarettes on the the campfires that wouldn't be acceptable for people with disabilities um, that are offered in uh, at a regular simple way camp. So it's it's a magical place. I'll, I'll, I'll just end it on that point. Absolutely. No, incredible. And I remember the waterfront too and all of the activities there and people getting out uh, either swimming or, you know, on, on, on the boats, et cetera, who don't always have that opportunity. So it was, it was a great, great time. Exactly. I, I had an opportunity to visit, to visit a couple of weeks. Years ago, and it's incredible how things have changed throughout the years in terms of making it a better place for people with a disability and disabilities. It's incredible. Absolutely. Going back to your earlier point, for sure, I think we reconnected in part on Facebook, but you know, I think we can give a, a, a you know, a, a hand up or a, a round of applause too to our mutual friend Anita Nowak, who is has a yes. empathic, uh, empathic action movement, who's done great, great work to help so many people. Yes, indeed, it's incredible that we have we can we we, uh, we all know each other after after. Uh, I, I I think what happened was like that and. I, I met Anita for coffee, and you didn't keep up. <laughs> and I said, well, I know a good boy. And then she started to uh, describe the good boy that she do, and it was an uh, exact same match. Yeah, no, she's, she's a wonderful person, and her empathic action movement is... Tremendous. She, she's really, uh, she's, she's helped so many people. I'll just say a funny thing. I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but yeah, Jeff Moore, it's a good thing it was the same one because I, I remember once looking up Jeff Moore, I think on Facebook and also on LinkedIn, and there were like 200 plus people with my spelling. So I was like, oh, you know, I'm not the only one out there. But anyway. Wow. Well, well, funny that you mentioned it, that uh, my friend sent me a uh, I linked to an article this past weekend about a Ian Smith on the West Island of Montreal. Okay. I, I went to school on the West Island of Montreal, a high school. And unfortunately, this Ian Smith was uh, not doing too many kind things. So, uh -oh. yeah, so. So, so look, there's there's a lot of things we can talk about in a in a short period of time here, but maybe we can talk a little bit about your career path and you know, some of the milestones that you've reached, and um, you know, and as you referred to it too, it's interesting in terms of being included in an able-bodied world. Um, so, so maybe you want to talk about some of your academics and first employment, and and just share some of the experiences there. Yes, well, I guess. I can show my experience in terms of being included all back then in the mid 80s. So the buzzword was integrated. So it was basically okay, we have a person with a disability that is excelling above the norm. How can we take? Let's put the I put them into a regular curriculum at school, and um, so uh, it all started in grade three when uh, my parents would ask continually if I wanted to make sure into a regular um, elementary school. And then I started to notice that 
I wasn't reading the same thing that my my neighbors were my neighbors kids were learning. We had the same age, same grade level, but it was different homework. So in grade five, I made the decision of saying, well, hey, um, if I wanted to progress like my, my brothers, I had to leave a special education system and get integrated into a normal elementary school system. So from there, I went to high school in which I had a program that provided services for disabled students, whether it be um, more time for exams, not taken in life, French for the, for the uh, visually impaired, so I excelled pretty well in high school. And then here in Quebec, we have a kind of a junior college system called the CTAP. And that was a very interesting uh, decision for me because you know, I assembled a CTAP on the I was in Montreal. I, I was advised to go to Dawson, which Dawson had more supportive services for the disabled. However, at that time, I wanted to follow my brother's um, academic path as much as possible, and they all went to Vendee College. So I went to Vendee College, they had the bare minimum in terms of services for the disabled, but I was able to cope, took uh, three years, graduated, and went on to um, Concordia University, where I uh, did my uh, bachelor's, uh, bachelor's of commerce people in uh, marketing. And from there, I did a year of uh, an internship at Industry Canada. Let me, let me and, ask uh, I, I just wanted to go back for one second to the integration okay. high school. And, and also maybe I'll touch on, because as you know, like Mackay Center had, and maybe it does still uh, like a reverse integration as well, right? But yes. did you find your integration in high school was, an, was you know, was that an, a, a very good experience? Do you, would you recommend that somehow the, the, the system tries to open up more opportunities to have more people go through these programs? Well, it's, it's interesting because um, they tried a two-pronged approach. The first approach was taken one student from the Brooklyn Center or one student from the from my elementary school that had other services for the disabled and put the big high school. The next approach was taken as the entire class and they took all the curriculum and put them in a high school setting. So rather than having one person or a couple of students on different day levels, they basically took the ecosystem that they had at the school and transplanted it into the high school. And of course, there's always challenges when it comes to um, integrating 
a parte de vender su bote en tu en tu high school o a o a academics my challenge was the high school that was chose for me was on the west end of Montreal uh, at the time I was living in central Montreal so the the bus ride was quite long because there was other um, students with disabilities on the bus so basically we did the tour of the island every day and it took maybe an hour and an hour, an hour and a half each day so it was quite tiring was that each way like an hour an hour and a half wow that's long yeah uh, and then if you factor in the weather it will take longer so and and once you left concordia how was it getting your first job Actually, it was it was tough because it, I'll show you I will do a a tiny two two tiny stories. So I was in my uh, last semester at Concordia, and uh, I didn't have any job prospects because. I was just focusing on my schoolwork and then um, I said to myself, okay, I'm just going to send out CVs when I, when I uh, graduate. But I went to uh, uh, a career counselor at Concordia and he took a, took a look at my CV and he said to me, he said, you look like you're in the wrong program. And I said, what do you mean by that? And they go, you wouldn't, you could have been your life a lot easier if you went into a social science field rather than a marketing field because marketing is all about communication and given the fact that you love my speech, the disability is not in your chest. So, it was, after that little, little encounter, I had to say to myself, well, is it right that I just wait for for um, four years of my life to study something that is going to be that was going to be not, not one bit useful to me. But I pushed it off. I said, well, hey, it's too late now because I already uh, did my four years. So, that was a little bit of a wake-up call to me. I, another wake-up call was the fact that I went to a, 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 a service that, that, was, that, is, that is geared towards people with a disability looking for a job. Uh, I guess this day, uh, I met with a agent that I guess either was overwhelmed or did not want to do any work or anyway, a long story short, he, the person said, well, if you don't find a job in the next three months, you should consider going on social assistance. So, given those two stories, it's like, it's very difficult to have right. uh, uh, a positive outlook 
when you have people who are supposed, supposedly need to help you out, then you will. You made the wrong decision. Now this is this first job was over twenty years ago, right? So maybe yes. twenty five years ago or over twenty years. So, so you know, there's there's so much more awareness now or talk, I believe, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And are are you optimistic that there there is a lot more openness now? You know, backing that up. And so, for example, when you're saying because of your speech impediment, they may say that you're not the right person for marketing. However, the bottom line is, you know, in our conversation right now, you know, I mean, and, and you know, it's very, to me, it's very clear everything that you're saying. If I had just met you, as we spoke about before, though, my ears may have to readjust because I, I you know, haven't heard your voice before. But all I'm trying to say is like, you know, do you believe that, what's going on with promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is leading to much more openness and hopefully more opportunities for people. Well, I would like to believe that there is more openness now, given the fact that there, there's, there's Great people with a variety of disabilities and can do the job. Now, whether or not the, the companies have the right decision makers making the right decisions are in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, it's, I, I think it comes down to whether the person has the very mindset to say, okay, this is a qualified person yes, right. who is going to give this person the opportunity. Yes, yes. And if he or she can get the job done. Yes. Now, whether or not it's a great fit after the the job basis. It it had to it has to proceed um naturally and both parties have to be transparent. So for example if if I to apply to a, a a job in marketing, and one of the prerequisites would be, oh, you kind of perform the follow up calls with the head office, I would say, well, maybe this job is not for me because of my disability and. I'm just seeing myself a whole bunch of anxiety knowing that this is a part of my task. I I was seeing my my employer that that shred of doubt and said, can he really perform this task? And if not, what kind of Resources, added resources to we need for him to perform this task. Right, right, right. right. Look, there's there's a lot of other things to talk about, but we, you know we can we can focus on a, on a few other things, and at the end of the day, also talk about some of the mental health challenges because at at its core, with the with the podcast, you know it's. It'll be great to hear your take and your advice to others or your, your own form of hand up to others. But okay. I wanted to ask you, um, you know, um, what are some of the main barriers? And I think you've touched on some of them, but that you faced through the, throughout the process of feeling that you're included in society. 
with transportation and I've seen you, you know, you've written on it, you've been interviewed on it, you've lobbied on it. So it's something you've, you've been able to, you know, to, to bring in terms of awareness, uh, but obviously it's still a major challenge and you know, something that there needs to be more, more, um, you know, more work done on in a big way. So. Yeah, I mean, it's getting better, but it's slow. And for, uh, and for a city that is already buying, buying by, uh, I would say, 15, 20 years, it's, uh, it's, it's very frustrating. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. What are the, you've mentioned some things, but in terms of other, you know, uh, other things you'd like to be or you'd like to see be done to, in terms of facilitating, you know, the overall opportunities and, you know, uh, engagement uh, possibilities of people with disabilities in society. What, what other things would you like to, to comment on or share? Well, I, 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 I'll show with you a common um, experience that I've been dealing with for the past what, 40 years, I will go back to uh, education or being um, sensitized to disabilities of, of all forms. So, um, 
when I go in, when I go shopping and do the, uh, uh, a young child and see the workshop for the first time, or, and you get the classic still, still, and you know what the next words out of the mouth will be. It's like, Mom, Dad, how come, how come she's in the wheelchair? Now, I think we'll add a time in, in, in life with the mother or father could say, okay, no, well, sweetie, he has a disability. He has certain challenges that he can do stuff, such as walking. However, unfortunately, it's either the, the parent says, I don't know, or they say, well, he cannot walk, which is probably true, but I, I would like to see some kind of a form of education for, for young parents saying, okay, during, during your children's life, they may come across somebody with a disability. This is how you deal with the situation. Right, right. Do you think, you know, you were talking about the integration program, or that's what they called it, that you were in high school with. Do you think that there should be more maybe presentations you know, at, at high schools, even primary schools, just to, to again, to share that, uh, you know, to educate people, to inform people, to build friendships, to to end any 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 stigma uh, regarding that as well, or or to help. Uh, I I think it should be part of the curriculum. Yeah, right. And it, 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 it's like a, it's like a financial literacy. Right. Right. Financial literacy is a basic thing that you should have in the in the. In the Curriculum, but it's, it's not taught. Right, right. Um, maybe, maybe it would fall, it would be under the uh, umbrella of diversity. diversity. Yes, right. So, I, I, other than that, it may just come down to, come to, come down to the parents just Right. Very good. Let's talk. Let's talk a bit about you know mental health and mental health issues. And again, uh, you know, getting back to the 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 goal of the podcast overall is to help to to eliminate stigma and to recognize that you know physical and mental health are intrinsic, important you know key aspects of everybody's health. And so, but as a, a person with a disability as well. You know, you, you, you've had your, your own journey and your own challenges. And so I uh, wanted to ask you to, to share some of, the, some of your experiences and observations. Well, I, 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 could, I could share with you my ongoing, my ongoing challenge. Like, I, when I got my first job, it was... I had a company that was, I was, I think we were seven people or maybe six. And we were doing, uh, we were working as if we were 50 plus employees. It was a small consulting company. But everybody had to pull their own weight for the company to survive. I, I always wondered every night if, if I was good enough. 
It's like, should I be working hard enough to continually pull myself in terms of what I contribute to the company? So, I used to go into work with a smile on my face, everything was hunky dory, but in my mind, I said, well, I bet I, I bet I screw up today, or I'm going to lose my job. Wow. Or somebody is going to blame me for not doing a task on time. Or um, there's a third point in my email that went out to 50,000 subscribers. I am going to be blamed for it because of my disability. So there was a, there was a mix of emotions that I had going into work every day. Were you, uh, were you sharing that with people or you also were like taking all of that weight on yourself with your own self-talk and trying to be strong on the outside or were you able to share that with people? No, I, 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 I kept it in. I kept it in. I came home, did a discussion with my brother, with my parents. And... What was, what about it is that I was working very hard to the point that it was taking up my, my social life. So when I, when I was saying it about everybody to, everybody's weekend, it was kind of annoying to say, well, I wish I had a weekend, but I'm working to catch up. I'm working to, to do my fair share of the work that was assigned to me. And one day, it just came crashing down. And, uh, it, it was something because it was a blood of my, my colleagues. So it was, it wasn't an easy thing to do deal with it at the time. And what was, I don't know if the word is ironic, but the fact that I didn't influence on my input, my, my, my colleagues, me and myself, that again, ask myself, what do they think of me the now? Which was tough to do at the time. I got help. Well, the company, we can do that not at the time. I don't know if there was a question of them not having the resources until something happened, or nobody was there to reach out to be and say, hey, yeah, are you okay? So if you were if you were advising somebody now who's listening to this, who may be feeling that stress and feeling like they, they can relate to your your situation, then what what would you be suggesting to them in terms of you know uh, reaching out for a hand up or or uh, or other things or not taking the weight of the world on their shoulders? I would say if if you find yourself doing much more than you can, go to somebody, completely become somebody at each other level in your organization and just say, look, 
I'm doing what I can, but if I do more, that is going to happen, and it's not going to help me, nor the organization that you, that you're looking for. Um, it, it, it's a question of managing your own expectations and the expectations of your play. Right. Maybe, maybe the best thing to do is to help a, a, a your um, I, I know if anything is, is to say, okay, am I meeting my expectations? Am I over delivering? And with those two aspects, you could take the time and recalibrate your professional and your private life to say, okay, I'm with the I went to work 45 hours a week instead of the 50 and that extra five, five hours, you can do whatever you want. Right, right, right. Very good. Are, are there are there other any other things that you'd like to mention or talk about in terms of, you know, current challenges or Again, your advice from your experiences, both for you know people who can give a hand up to others and people who are in need of a hand up, given some of the challenges you know that you've experienced. And I, I, I really think it's all about communication and transparency. Right. If if you feel that you are in a, uncomfortable way or somebody is not 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 seeing your disability as a how should I say uh, a no deficit to what they they want to uh, achieve in the in the organization. I will just talk about it. There's no, there's no wrong, oh, there's no wrong answers about how you feel or how you, you, what you are thinking. It's your, it's your experience, and you have to be a part of the solution. Yes. You don't have all the answers, right? And the best. The best way to get the answers is to discover different options and pick the right options for you now and into the future. Because I'm a big, big fan of the thinking of it, thinking ahead. Yes, right. Anticipating the future. Right. Because it's like, it, it, it's, it's like a, life is like a, a, a computer. The, 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 the most that you can get from a computer is the time that you open it and take it out of the box for the first time. And once you use it for the first time, that, that's where you call it to get the most of it. So it's like that with finding help. Okay, it's gonna be the help is immediate, but if you want it to be sustainable, you gotta think ahead and anticipate the needs that you will have. Right, very good. And hopefully in these communications, again, to, to not be afraid, you know, people are seeking out trusted friends or family to start. And then within a corporate setting, you know, unfortunately, yes, there, there can be stigma. There can be other things that exist. So 
you know, to find to find the right path, the right person or the right department to w- w- that you can trust, right? Because you know, it's it's and then and then to move through there. Some of these things are are very personal, and people don't have to be an open book. But you know, starting again with 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 trusted relationships and and building on those, I think are are important not to be set back. Um, you know. Exactly. I, I, I to go to, to go back to my point in terms of being transparent. You just had to find the right person to talk to. Yes. Because if you going to find somebody in HR, that is just going to fill out a form for you, for you to talk to somebody. Maybe that's not the right person right. to be going in that yep. with, with, your, with your challenges. That's right. Well, look, I think we've covered a lot of ground, Smitty, and uh, I think the last time I saw you in person, we had a, a coffee together when it was even pre-COVID, so it can take yes. these uh, things, and hopefully, you know, that'll be there'll be more opportunities for that. But, you, you know, I really appreciate you sharing your journey uh, on this podcast. I'm sure it'll help a lot of people. And, you know, I think everybody, again, we were, um, you know, we, we, we all can help each other and we all need help at times. And so there's no shame in that whatsoever. So to share, to share, you know, you having shared your story, I think is, is, is fantastic and will help a lot of people too. Thank you for helping me. Um, Jeff, it's been, uh, been a, a great time and uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. Super, super. All the best. Thank you. Thanks, Smitty. Take care. Take care.